we began a new series entitled Church 101, Back to Basics. And what we saw was that as individuals and as churches, we can often become very easily focused on the wrong things. Or last week we talked about some things that churches pay a lot of attention to is often their numbers of attendance. Or if they have a full parking lot. But you won't find that anywhere in the Bible, of what, what God emphasizes. Um, we can devote ourselves to a variety of different activities and tasks that we think are important, and then end up neglecting the things that God tells us that really matter to Him. What we saw from our scripture passages last week were four major areas that God says that we as individuals, and by extension that we as churches should be focused on, the things that really matter to Him, are equipping, edifying, exalting, and evangelizing. And then if you were here for our evening service, we spent our evening service Bible study discussing the reasons why, even as a church, when we realize, we understand that those four expectations that God has for us, why we often fail to meet those expectations and live up to those standards the way that, that God expects from us. But today we're going to look at three things that I believe that the Bible emphasizes, not in a legalistic way. Please hear me today. I'm not saying we need to do it this way or else you're doing it wrong. That's not what I'm saying. But we are going to see... Three areas that the Bible indicates is ways to help us grow in our efforts to do what God has called us to do. So I've entitled today's message, What Ship Are You On? And the reason why is that each of our points today are going to end with the word ship. Now I'm not going to tell you what they are because I'm sure you're all just brimming with excitement to find out what the points are. Um, but we're, we're going to be discussing some things that the Bible indicates as being indicators of how we are growing and connecting individually as, a, as believers in Christ and how we are using that to connect into um, the body of Christ. The, the main point of today's message is to indicate where we are when it comes to these areas and then understand how that relates to our church fulfilling the major expectations that God has for us. So if you would find 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that's where we're going to be reading from. And then if you would put a pen or a marker in Acts chapter 2. We'll return to Acts chapter 2 later on. But once you found 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would stand, please, if you're able to, out of the honor of the reading of God's word. We're going to be begin in verse 12, and we'll read down through verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 12, God's word says, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made all to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now God hath set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the bodies? Verse 20, But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more these members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant Comeliness. Verse 24, for our comely parts have no need. But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or whether one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you once again for the privilege of being in your house. Lord, we thank you that we have the sound minds where we can make the decision to be here. We thank you for the ability that we have to read your word and to hear from it. We thank you for the physical health that allows us to be in your building today. Yes. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters that would like to be here with us but are unable to. Yes. They have some physical need that, that's keeping them away by some physical infliction of, of of pain or, or sickness. Lord, we pray that you'll touch them and restore them to our, our fellowship once again. Lord, I pray that while we're here, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to take advantage of this most amazing
amazing opportunity to not just hear your word, but to apply your word to our lives. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that's holy. I thank you that's perfect. I thank you that's preserved. And Lord, I ask now that as we look at it, Lord, that you will just hide me behind the cross. Lord, I pray yes. that you will keep me from saying anything that is my own opinion or my own volition. Yes. I pray that everything that we speak today will be uh, from you. Lord, as always, nobody here needs to hear from me, but we all need to hear from you. Yes. And I pray that you will speak to us today in a very real way, a very profound way. It challenges us, Father. Help us to grow. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for standing. You can take your seats. For the first ship that we're going to look at today is membership. If you look back, starting back in verse 12, look at how many times the word members is used. Verse 12, for as the body is one, it hath many members, and all the members of that one body. Verse 14, for the body is not one member, but many. Verse 18, but now God hath set the members, every one of them, in the body. Verse 19, and if they were all one member. Verse 20, but now... Excuse me, verse 20, but now are they many members, yet but one body. Verse 22, those members of the body, which seem more feeble, are necessary. Verse 23, and those members of the body. Verse 26, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, and one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. Verse 27, it's kind of where we concludes our, our reading for today. For now you are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Now, this idea of, of membership is something that oftentimes people push back against or disagree with. And there are some wonderful Christian men. There are even some pastors that I consider very close friends, people that I would consider mentors to myself who don't necessarily believe that church membership is biblical. And the reason why people sometimes question the necessity of church importance or, or the necessity or the importance of church membership it's very simply, is because the word church membership is not in the Bible. Um, now, but if you've ever done any basic word studies, you'll find that the word Trinity isn't in the Bible either. Hmm. But without question, the concept of the Trinity, one God with three separate distinct persons, God the Holy Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, is very real, very re relevant within the Bible. Another word that is not mentioned in the Bible is rapture. That's right. Yeah. But, the, but the concept of believers being caught up to meet the Lord in the air is obviously very well present in our Bible. Uh, that's right. So even though the term church membership is not mentioned in the Bible, I believe the concept of church membership is in the Bible. And when we talk about church membership, really what we're talking about is a covenant community. People who have agreed together to come together for the same specific purposes. And we're going to look at what those might be. But as a church, what is presented in the Bible is a group of people who have covenanted together for three Three specific reasons, to love each other, to take care of each other, and the third reason, to hold each other accountable. Mm. Now those first two things, everybody loves to be loved, right? Yeah. Everybody loves to be taken care of for, but not many people in the spirit, or not many people in our human flesh want to be held accountable to other people. Mm. Mm. We'll talk about that as we go through as well. And one reason why people might attend church for years, but never actually join the church, it could be that they like coming to church, but they don't really want to be accountable to anybody. And we see here in this very book, if you read, if you read 1 Corinthians in its entirety, it's not a long book, I would encourage you to do that. Paul warns the church here at Corinth about this guy who is doing some immoral things and says, hey, you, you need to do something. You need to approach this guy. You need to confront him and tell him that he needs to repent. And if he doesn't repent, you need to remove him from your number. Mm. Now, how can you remove somebody from your number if they're not already part of your number? <coughs> That's second, in 2 Corinthians Paul writes to them again to commend them for taking these steps of action and removing the sinning brother from their membership. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, or sorry, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, if you want to write that down for later, in plain terms, it says that they removed him by a, by a vote of the majority. So obviously there was a group of people who took action to say, this, this guy's living in sin, he's no longer counted among us in our number. Now that would be impossible to do if there was not a sense of membership. In Acts chapter 6, you read about election of officers, which implies that there is some sort of membership that is doing the voting to elect these officers. At the end of 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul writes to Timothy to instruct them on how to deal with widows in the church. There's even some language mentioned uh, of creating a roster so that the leaders of the church know how to identify who the widows are and how to best meet their needs and to care for them mm -hmm. as best as they can. So we see that 
that there is some direction in the Bible given that even though the word church membership is not used, the concept of church membership in itself does exist. But we also see that church membership isn't just mentioned as a guideline for churches. It's something that the Bible addresses in very practical terms for us individually as believers as well. If you'll turn over there to Acts chapter 2, in verse 41 it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now what is that referring to? Well, if you look at it in context, we read it, it says, The people who believed in Jesus and put their faith in him were baptized. Okay, well, that's what we see there at the beginning of the verse. And then after they were baptized, it says, There were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, who was that them referring to? Well, if we read it all in, 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 in context, the number of people, that, that them is referring to the number of people who are already identified as being members of a specific group of believers. So in a very basic sense, we see the fundamental steps that God lays out for every believer. Believe, put your faith in Jesus Christ, be baptized by immersion, identify yourself with, with, as, as a believer in Jesus Christ, and then belong. Believe, be baptized, and belong. It's God's, it's God's intention for you to not live your Christian life in isolation. It's God's intention for you to live your life within a local community in our day and age, which is the local church. So those are the biblical reasons for membership, but there are also some very practical reasons for membership. If you'll turn back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll see all sorts of body parts that are mentioned. In, in verse 15, it mentions feet. Verse 16 mentions ears and eyes. Verse 17 mentions the nose. Verse 21 mentions eyes, hands, and feet. Now think for a minute here and be honest. What else could this be talking about except membership within the local body of believers? I mean, ask yourself, do you really think that God intended us to refer to each other as body parts? I mean, I'll use Philip as an example. Philip just joined us this morning. Hmm. If I was going to introduce Philip to someone, I, don't, I wouldn't say, hey, come meet Philip. He's an elbow in our church. <laughs> there, there's Ruth. She's an ankle in our church. There's Mr. Harold. He's a shoulder. Every come over and check out all of our body parts we have over here. There's Uncle Gary. Uncle Gary's a... You don't even want to know. He's a pain in the... I'll, I'll it. I'm joking. But you get the point. But when we read this passage, I don't think anybody here questions that it's referring to that the members of a local assembly should be interconnected and joined together. Amen. 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 As a church, we should have members that are connected and working together very much the same way that our individual body parts are connected and work together for our own health. In verse 25, it sums it up by saying... The reason for that is that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care of the Now, that word schism, we don't hear it very often. I actually heard it on the it's Weather Channel the other day, of all, of all places. But the word schism, what it means is separation or disconnection. And one of the reasons why church membership matters is very simply, it's a design by which God gave us to care for each other. Look at verse 25 again. There should be no schism. Again, we should be all joined together. We should all be members together, working together, that the members should have the same care one for another. Amen. This is Church membership is the design by which God gives us to clearly care for one another. And I'm going to stop for a minute here and make up a sort of a public service announcement. I'm not saying that church membership is at all related to your salvation. That's right. That's not what I'm saying. <clears throat> Just like baptism is not what saves you, church membership is not what saves you either. And the, real, the reality is, we talked about this probably a couple months ago on our Wednesday night Bible studies. The reality is, is that your church membership is, is either going to fall off when you fly to heaven or it's going to burn off when you go to hell. Hmm. The only thing that saves you is your own individual relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. That's not Amen. what we're saying, but we do see the biblical basis here for church membership. Amen. But the reason why church membership matters, once again, is because it illustrates a commitment to a specific called out assembly of believers. In our sense, that would be a church. And when we have baptism Sunday in a couple weeks, when people go down there, they're already saved before they get in our baptistry. Right. But what they do is they come here, they, they make a visual demonstration, a visual illustration of something they've already decided in their life to align themselves with, with Jesus Christ as their Savior. Mm -hmm. And when you join the membership of the church, you, what you're doing is you're taking a visual or illustrative uh, demonstration to align yourself with a local body of believers. It's, it's very, very similar. In, in our sense, the church needs to be interconnected. Because, as we see here, as Paul writes here, I'll just summarize, you know, my, my hand can't just wake up tomorrow and decide, you know, 
I'm kind of bored here. I'm going to go join another body. Hmm. You know, my, my foot came to the side. You know what? That, that body over there looks more interesting, more exciting. I'm going to leave and go away. That, that's not the way that um, that's intended. You know, my, my ears can't decide, you know, I'd rather go somewhere else. I'm just going to leave this body and join somewhere else. So we, we see here, my hands can't decide. My fingers can't decide that they don't want to be part of my body anymore. I know Brother Bud had a fingertip that, that, that didn't want to stick around, but that's the exception. <laughs> so so if, if you don't know that story, it has Brother Bud about it. But that's, you'll have to see him after church. But what I'm saying is, is first of all, there is no perfect church. That's right. Amen. And make no mistake about it. If you find one, the moment you join it, it won't be perfect anymore because you're not perfect. Mm-hmm. None of us are. And there's a danger in our society today of this consumer mindset that has permeated our way in self and mm-hmm. even churches. Yeah. Just to give an example, I was, um, I'm, I've been trying to eat healthier and, and exercise and trying to be a, a good steward of the body that, that God has given me. But if you were to ask me, where is your favorite fast food burger in town? I don't have to hesitate. The rodeo burger, Burger King. Anything with an onion ring and barbecue sauce on it, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor. I would join that church right there. I'll take my shoe off right now. You deep fry it, put an onion ring on it, let me slather barbecue sauce, I'll do whatever you want. But the problem is, I like the, I like the burgers from Burger King. Amen. <laughs> but the only issue is across the street at McDonald's, they have any size soft drink you want for 99 cents. Oh, and I love Diet Coke. So what happens sometimes, I, I, I've actually driven to Burger King, got my sandwich at Burger King, and driven across the street and got my drink at McDonald's. Now, is there anything wrong with that? No. I, I mean, not, well, health-wise, there would be something wrong with that. So I'm doing it every day. It's probably a problem. You have to stage of intervention. That you can but the issue is, spiritually speaking, is there anything wrong with me going to Burger King for a burger and McDonald's for a drink? No. But the problem is, God did not design churches to be work the same way or be viewed the same way as restaurants. Now, I've heard of people even recently who, when I ask, well, where do you go to church? They say they attend three or four different churches. And I said, well, well what do you mean? And I asked them why. They said, well, I like the preaching over here, but I like the music of this church. I like this church's children's ministry, so we're part of that. Or I like the small groups over here. So they're involved in three or four different churches. Mm-hmm. And what happens is effectively they end up going to all these churches to be ministered to and never end up being connected enough to minister to the body of believers right. over there. Right. So once again, why is church membership practical? Because once again, we see in verse 25, it's the means by which God gives us as believers to take care of each other. Mm-hmm. Think again about body parts. If I get an itch in my left elbow, I just said it, I'm starting to. <laughs> my, my, my brain receives a signal that says, hey, your left elbow itches. You know what it doesn't do? My brain doesn't send down magic brain waves and just take away the itch and obliterate it. Mm-hmm. What it does is it sends a message down my nerves, through my right arm, to my right fingertips and says, hey, your brother left elbow itches. And what happens, my right hand reaches over and scratches my left elbow. Now, the way that God works, does his work in the, in the world is through the body. And we have to be able to depend on each other. Because if I'm separated from the body of Christ, I'm oftentimes separated from the activity of God in my life. And if I separate myself from the body of Christ, other people are deprived of the, of the interconnectedness of me being connected to that body the way that God intended me to be. In the same way that when God wants to do his work in somebody's life, he rarely sends down his answer directly from heaven. Usually what he does is he gives an answer to another part of the body. <clears throat> if there's something in my life that I'm praying about, if I'm praying to God, you know, please help me with my marriage, please help me with my kids, please help me with my jobs, <clears throat> please help me with my finances. What happens sometimes, if you're not connected to God, if you've been disconnected from the local body of church, God is, is often like, you know, you're asking me to do something that I gave the church to do. There are other body members who can fill this need. But as long as you're disconnected from that local group, you're not going to get the answers right. the, the way that, that you right. would expect uh, to be blessed by the Lord. So in that sense, if I don't belong to the church, if I'm not a member of it, the same way that my body members are part of my body, then I'm disconnected from the work of God in my life. So what we really see is in order to really follow God, we have to really belong. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned this during the adult Sunday school class. There are 59 one another commands in the Bible. Just in the New Testament. Mark 9.50 says, be at peace with one another. John 13.34, love one another. 
Romans uh, 12, 10, be devoted to one another. Now, how do you do that if you are not known and committed within a local body of believers? In a practical sense, we see the church membership matters because it's a way that God wants us to care for each other. Another practical reason for church membership is it's a way to make your, your commitment to Christ in a very and his people in a very visible way. We just talked about that just like with baptism. Church membership is a way you can identify yourself with a local body of believers. And when you join a church, we are offering ourselves to be encouraged, to be served, but also to be rebuked and to be corrected. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, a lot, of, a lot of people like coming to church because they like being encouraged and served. But when you commit yourself to joining a church, you're submitting to not just the fun stuff, but the encouragement and the service, but you're also offering yourself to be rebuked and corrected. And in Hebrews chapter 13, we're going to talk about this a little bit tonight during an evening Bible study, speaks about placing ourselves under spiritual leaders and submitting to their authority. And that can be a difficult thing because we have a natural tendency as people to be overly independent. And membership in a practical sense is practical because it helps us to hold us accountable. <coughs> it, it's submitting ourselves in a way that says, hey, I'm part of something bigger than myself. I'm not just one of 50 or 100 or 200 individual people, I'm part of the body of Christ. Now, in and of itself, there's some, we, we went through the text here, there's some of our, our body parts that might seem kind of feeble and not unnecessary. But they're necessary to the body as a whole to complete the task that God has for us to do. So we see that one way that the Bible indicates is a mean for us as believers uh, to fulfill our emphasis within the church is membership. God makes it very clear that his intention is for every believer to belong and the next two points, I'm going to ask you to turn back over to the book of Acts. And if you know anything about church history, specifically if you've studied the book of Acts, you know that the early church is our model. Yeah. It's what we base our church off of today. Uh, the things that we do, the things that we emphasize, they shouldn't be things that we just come up with on our own. Now, I shouldn't just wake up tomorrow and say, I've got this great idea. It's nowhere in the Bible, but let me try it at church. That's not how it's supposed to be. We're supposed to use God's word um, as our basis. Right. We should be using God's words as our model for what we focus on. And what we see next is as is a church, we should be focused on discipleship. There in, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, we saw that once people were saved, they were baptized, they were added to the church. And the next thing we see is in verse 42, it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, discipleship is a word that you've probably all heard before, but you might be wondering what that really means. And what discipleship is, is helping um, believers follow Christ and grow in their relationship with the Lord. And we see here how the early church accomplished this. In verse 42 it says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. When they got together, the first thing that's mentioned is that they studied God's word. Now this should go without saying, but there is a problem, there is a huge problem in churches that don't emphasize the preaching and teaching of God's word as their primary focus. Mm, amen. Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have music or that we shouldn't sing songs or that we shouldn't give testimonies. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have offerings as a way to contribute to the work here locally in God's kingdom uh, throughout the world. But if we're going to disciple people, if we're going to help believers follow Christ and grow in their relationship with the Lord, there has to be a commitment first and foremost to the preaching and teaching of God's word. Mm, amen. In fact, over just a few pages in Acts chapter 14, it says that when Paul and Barnabas it says they went through the cities of uh, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, and they exhorted the believers there. They comforted them. They encouraged them. And how did they do that? It says that they taught them. So in a practical sense, how does discipleship take place? Well, first and foremost, we see here, in, in order for discipleship to occur, it has to happen regularly. In verse 42, where it says that they continued steadfastly, what that means is that they came together regularly. Mm -hmm. In a very basic, very practical sense, if you don't meet with believers in an ongoing, regular basis, make no mistake about it, you might come to church, but you're not getting discipled. Mm -hmm. Now this idea of discipleship has components of responsibility that fall on both of us as a church, but they also fall on us individually as believers as well. As a church, we have a responsibility to, first and foremost, to offer regularly scheduled services. Why? Because if we're always changing the days and times that we meet, people don't know when to meet together and be discipled. Yeah. That's why we try to make everything as clearly as we can. We've got a sign out front. We've got bulletins. We've got a website that all has our service times of when we meet together to, to study God's Word. 
Because if we want people to be discipled, we want them to know what those times are when we're meeting together for that purpose. So that's the church's responsibility. And as an individual, if you want to be discipled, you have a responsibility to come to those regularly scheduled services. Once again, the beginning of verse 42, it says, they continued. Now once again, who is that they? Going back to verse 41, mm -hmm. the same people that were saved, baptized, and added to the church. Mm -hmm. yep. wow. What we see is that once you get saved, once you identify as a believer in Jesus Christ, through baptism and connecting with the local church, there should be a natural desire to grow and learn more about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That is part of your own individual growth that benefits us as a church. Now, I know some people have to work at night and other people have other obligations, but can I just point out that there is, without question, there is a breakdown somewhere spiritually in your life if you know the Bible is being taught, being studied, being discussed, and you have no desire, as verse 42 says here, to continue steadfastly in, in that doctrine. There's a breakdown somewhere spiritually if you have no right. desire to meet back together when you know God's word is being taught. Yeah. And I'm not trying to you know, beat anybody up or make anybody feel guilty, but the problem is we are as close to the Lord as we really want to be. Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. That's James right. 4, 8 says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Amen. That's right. The matter of the fact is, if, if I'm not as close to God as I should be, or as close to God as I could be, it's because it's not because God is hiding from me. Uh, that's right. It's because I'm not right. seeking him. I'm not trying to get close to him the way that I should. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is, all over our country today, People who will make the excuse that they can't come back for evening service for an hour tonight will have no problem staying on the couch and watching football for three hours. Yeah. Yeah. None. We don't have a problem sitting down and talking on the phone or scrolling Facebook for two hours in the afternoon. Yeah. Right. We don't have a problem going out shopping, mm. going out to the lake cutting our grass for two hours. We have no problems doing that. Yep. The issue here is if you're not growing spiritually, it's not because the church isn't offering discipleship opportunities, it's because you haven't taken advantage of what your responsibility is as an individual believer to actually come and be discipled. Yes. Again, what is discipleship? Helping believers follow Christ and grow in their relationship with Him. Mm -hmm. What that really refers to is coming alongside someone to help them grow, not just in their knowledge of God's Word, but their application of it. Oftentimes, discipleship takes place in a much more personal and intimate setting. Sometimes in, in smaller groups, even in one-on-one -on -one teaching, discussing God's Word. Now, can discipleship take place here on a Sunday morning? Yes, of course, and it should. It should. You should be learning something when you're here for the morning service. But there's a benefit to meeting together, as the verse says here, continually and steadfastly. Because it, it, it gives us the opportunity for us as body believers to not just be preached to, but to be discipled. Mm. Now, don't get me wrong. Preaching is part of discipleship. And if you were here last week, you remember my main role as, as a pastor here is to equip the saints for the ministry. And the main way that, that is accomplished on my end is through my responsibility to preach the ministry of the word. Mm -hmm. But if preaching is the only way that you're being instructed, you're missing out on a, on a very critical part of spiritual growth. Because although preaching is related to discipleship, they are different. Mm -hmm. All throughout the Bible, we see that God emphasizes both preaching and teaching. Amen. And maybe the best way to explain the difference between those two things, between preaching and teaching, is to look to the Apostle Paul. And thus, we mentioned the early church is our model for the way that we conduct church now. But Paul is also the model or the pattern for what we see for discipleship. Now, if you know anything about Paul's life, you know that he wrote the book of Romans to the church at Rome. He wrote the book of 1st and 2nd Corinthians to the church at Corinth. Galatians was written to the, the church at Galatia. Colossians was written to the church at Colossae. Uh, Ephesians to the church at Ephesus. Philippians was written to the church at Philippi. 1st and 2nd First and Second Thessalonians were written to the church at Thessalonica. So Paul clearly had a vested interest in the body of the church as a whole. But he also had a very special interest in the lives of individual believers too. First and Second Timothy weren't written to churches; they were written to one person. <coughs> he didn't write the book of Titus to an entire church; he wrote it to one person, Titus. Same with the book of Philemon. These were all books that were written to individual people. Now, if you think anything, we think about Paul. Think about all the other people that he mentions by name that nobody else talks about. Mm. Yeah. It's right. having personally come alongside of them, 
worked with them and helped them develop their faith. If you want to write this text down, write down Romans chapter 16. Or if you want to flip over there, I'm just going to name some of the people that Paul lists in just Romans chapter 16. Phoebe, Aquila and Priscilla, Epinatus, Mary, Andronicus, Junia, Amplius, Urbane, Statius, Apellus, Aristobulus, Herodian, Narcissus, Tryphema and Tryphosa, Persis, Rufus, Asyncritus, Phlegon, Her Hermas, Petrobes, Her Hermes, Philologus, Julia, Nereus, Olympus, Timotheus, Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, Gaius, and Erastus. Now, let's be honest. When's the last time you heard any preaching on Andronicus? <laughs> You know, you probably didn't know it. And secret, this was in the Bible, so you just read it just now. I know some of you probably remember those great Sunday school lessons about philologists you heard as a child, right? <laughs> but Paul knew. Yeah. And why? Because he obviously had a personal relationship with her. Mm -hmm. In other words, Paul discipled her. That's right. So what does that have to do with us as a church? This is a place where there should not only be preaching, but teaching too. Amen. This is an, there's an emphasis not only on preaching to the entire group, but also discipleship, which takes place in smaller groups, sometimes even one-on-one. -on -one. As you see here in Paul's case, there's a lot of these people, that, he's the only one who names. But he, which indicates he was discipling them personally, mm. by himself. Discipleship lends itself to the more personal nature of sharing information, of asking questions, and discussing God's word in a smaller group. So if you're going to ask me, well, what would we do if we started having you know, 60 people show up here on Sunday night and Wednesday nights? Well, first and foremost, that'd be a good problem to have. You know? Like mm -hmm. we're talking about expanding the parking. That's a good problem to have when you have to start adding parking spaces. <coughs> but what would end up happening is we would probably split apart in smaller groups so that everybody is not just preached to. Everybody actually has a chance to be discipled to. Because we see an emphasis on membership and discipleship. And next we see fellowship. Back there in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Now that word fellowship comes from the Greek word koinonia. It refers to communion or sharing together or partaking in the same activities one with another. Now, what do we activity do we typically associate with the word fellowship? Eating. Food. <laughs> Eating. Why? Because we're Baptists, right? I heard a story about a kindergarten teacher who asked her students to bring in an item for show and tell that had something to do with her family's religion. And this little girl, Kate, stood up and said, my family's Catholic and this is a rosary. A boy named Joshua stood up and said, my family's Jewish and this is Star of David. A little boy named Johnny said, my family's Baptist and this is a casserole dish. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's no secret that we like to eat here. But why do we emphasize it? It's not just because we want to get together the first Sunday every month and, and have a meal together. Now, that's nice, but that's not the, that's not the reason we do it. It's because we see here very clearly that because eating together is part of fellowship. Right. Verse 42 says that when they continued in fellowship, it goes on and says mm. what was involved. It says that they, they studied God's word together mm. and breaking of bread. But it wasn't just that. It wasn't just studying God's word. It wasn't just eating together. And then we see the end of verse 42, but it also involved praying together. Amen. Right. In verse 42, it says that the fellowship involved the breaking of bread and prayer. Now, I want you to think for a minute about the people who you study the Bible with most. The people who you share the most meals with. The people who you pray with the most. Those are the people who you have true fellowship with. Regardless of if where, not most, I didn't ask, where did you go to church on Sunday morning? Who do you pray with? Who do you study God's word with? Who are you doing life with together? Because those are the people you have true fellowship with. So as a church, what practical reasons do we have biblically for being committed to membership, discipleship, and what we see here in fellowship is for one, it brings glory to God. Remember, God fellowship is part of God's creative design for us as individuals. If you remember, all the way back in Genesis, it tells us that we are made in Christ's image. And just as God, who is triune in nature, who has fellowship with himself, we reflect God's character when we have a relationship not only with him, but when we have a relationship with each other with, with each other as well. Also remember, Jesus commanded us to love one another. 
we are able to resemble Jesus when we come together and we, we unify with his people. If you remember, it goes on later on, it, it tells us that they'll know that we are Christians by our love one to another. Mm. So why should we have fellowship? Because it identifies us as being separate from the world and being identified with the body of Christ. Amen. <coughs> Another reason why fellowship is important is very simply because we need each other. Yes. We just read this all in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I don't care if you have the healthiest arm in the world. If you go home today and your ankle acts up, there's a problem in your entire body. Yes. If, if, if you go home today and you've got a sound mind and you can think and you can speak and you can you can form big sentences, but you go home and today and something happens and you break your back, your body is changed yes. and impacted by that. Yes. We need each other because the, the reality is God created us all with unique gifts, personalities, and traits and characteristics. That I don't have that none of us here it helps us all on our own. Think about, there, there's some things, there's some parts of your body you probably don't think about that much until it starts acting up. <laughs> I, I know, like back in, in the wintertime, I had this terrible back pain. Where I had to go, I, was, I had to crawl out of bed and go to the chiropractor. You know what? I didn't think about my back that much before leading up to that. Mm -hmm. But once that happened, it, it didn't matter how good my legs were, <laughs> it didn't matter how strong my, my ears and my wrists and my smelling were at that point. There, there's a body that says here, when one, one member suffers, we all suffer with it. None. That's why we all need to be connected. God needs us all working together to accomplish his purpose. And you think, mm -hmm. well, what, what does that have to do with me? We're going to kind of see as that goes on. But Romans 14, once again, Paul writes and tells us that none of us lives into ourselves, and none of us dies into ourselves. Yes. In other words, God did not intend you to live your Christian life to be lived independently. You're not supposed to be a lone wolf Christian. You're not supposed to live your Christian life independently. He designed us to live in community. Fellowship with each other is, ne is necessary in order for us to encourage each other to run our spiritual race as well. To encourage each other not to fall away from Christ. To, to bear each other's burdens. To help each other out in the time of need. If you think about that, we need all different types of body parts, all different types of members to accomplish the task during the day. And we need each other, we need every member join together if we're going to bear one another's burdens effectively. So we see the three areas that the Bible indicates as being important when it comes to accomplishing what God has called us to do, our membership, discipleship, and fellowship. And our final point today is related to all, all of our three previous points, and that's relationship. Everything that we've talked about today comes down to relationship in some way. If you're here today and you've been saved, your, your spiritual journey began when you began your relationship with Jesus Christ. When you accept him as your Savior, when you put your faith in him. And once you put your faith in him, the next step that we saw today is to establish a relationship with a local body of believers. Once you join with the local church, the next step is to be discipled, discipleship. And as we just, we just talked about, a key point to discipleship is having personal relationships with, with individuals, with people. To commit to studying God's word together. To knowing each other personally so that you can see how the Bible applies to our lives personally and practically. And obviously, relationship is related to fellowship. Because the closer we are to each other, the more that we love each other, the, the better we are able to pray for each other and bear one another's needs. Again, the title of today's message is, What Ship Are You On? Let me think for a minute as we close. Where are you in your spiritual walk? What stage are you in in these areas that we've looked at today? Where are you at with membership? For the areas of discipleship and fellowship. Because God wants us to be committed and connected in all three of these areas. So I got Miss Janet come forward, Brother Bud, if we're preparing up for a time of invitation. Look at that, every head bowed, every eye closed. We've seen from our time in God's Word that three areas that God emphasizes as markers to be present in the life of believers. If you're here today, maybe you're, you're not as connected to God. Maybe you're not as connected to the church as you should be. Maybe you're not a member. Maybe you are a member. But even if you are a member, maybe you're not as close, closely connected to the body as you should be. If you'd like prayer about being more closely connected to the body of Christ, if that's something that God's hope in your heart, I'll take you. Raise your hands. We can pray with you about that. You have to see those hands. Take them down if you raise them. Right, yes, take them down. The Lord spoke to your heart about discipleship. Maybe you haven't been taking advantage of the opportunity to grow and be discipled. 
Maybe the Lord spoke to your heart about making, uh, being taught and instructed in his word more of a priority in your life. Maybe God spoke to your heart and said, I'm saved. Maybe, maybe you're even a member of the church. Maybe you come to all the services you can, but if you're to be honest, you're not personally investing in anybody else's life. If you'd like prayer about any of these areas related to discipleship, if that's something on your heart, raise your hands. We can pray with you about that. Amen. Let's seal those hands. Yes, you can take them down if you raise them. Maybe the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart about fellowship. You could say, you know, to be honest, I don't know my brothers and sisters in the Lord as well as I should. I want to know how to minister to my church family better. How to pray for people more effectively. How to encourage them and comfort them. If that's your prayer today, if you'd like prayer about that, just raise your hands so you can pray to me about that. Amen. Yes, you see those hands? Yes, you can take them down to Jerusalem. Thank you. Can everybody stand, please? Close with a word of prayer. Our Lord, Father, we just thank you for those that are here today, Lord. We pray for those that have indicated, Lord, that a need in their life, Father, yes. Lord, to be more Amen. closely aligned and more connected. <coughs> we pray for the people that have um, indicated that maybe they're, they haven't joined, maybe they have joined, but they're just not as, as connected to the body as they should be. Let's pray that you'll. Remove whatever obstacles there are, Father, that are, that are hindering that from occurring, but from keeping from being closer to you and closer to the church. Lord, I pray for those that raise their hands about discipleship. People who um, maybe are growing well in their own personal life, but they're not really discipling or taking anybody else under their wing. Lord, we thank you once again for the example of Paul, who saw how many people he was investing in. Lord, I just pray you help us to have a heart to, uh, to serve each other, Lord, by helping us grow. In our, in our own spiritual walks with our brothers and sisters in the world. Father, I pray for those that, that prayed about fellowship, Lord, and pray that yes. whatever those needs may be, or the issues that are complications that are, that are hindering their, their walk together with you, their fellowship here with, with us in the church. Lord, I just pray uh, that you help them to get victory in these areas. Lord, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.